Hello, my name's Steve Wade. I'm a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what is resilience. Resilience is a very popular concept these days. Uh, we hear it everywhere. Uh, res resilience is talked about in terms of resilient communities, in terms of resilient cities, in terms of resilient ecosystems, in the context of development as well. But what actually is resilience? Within academia, resilience has been studied in a lot of different fields, going all the way back actually to the 1800s when resilience was first studied in engineering. More recently, the use of resilience has branched out to other fields starting in the 1970s. In psychology, resilience has been studied as the ability to bounce back from negative emotional experiences. This more individually focused tradition of resilience research has moved into other areas, for example, community resilience, and also resilience in the context of development or poverty alleviation. And that's a very popular framing for development inter interventions these days. Also back in the 1970s, resilience started to be used in the context of e ecology, uh, where it was defined in 1973 as the persistence of systems and their ability to absorb change and disturbance. This more generally more systems focused version of resilience is really rather complementary to the individual focused version of resilience that started in psychology. As resilience in ecology was studied over the decades, there was a realisation that just studying the ecosystems by themselves can't help to understand sustainability and sustainable development. So the study of resilience shifted from just ecosystems into social ecological systems, which are understood to be the systems uh, in which both humans and the environment uh, are embedded and are a part of. So in social ecological systems, resilience, according to one definition, is understood as the capacity to adapt or transform in the face of change. And then associated with this specific understanding or understandings of resilience is a broader area of study called resilience thinking, which uh, one study defined as a loosely organised cluster of concepts and tools for understanding and managing change in complex social ecological systems. The version of resilience that I work with is the social ecological resilience version, which incorporates both the individual and systems aspects of resilience. One useful way to understand this version of resilience, this variety of resilience, is through three capacities. The capacity to persist, the capacity to adapt, and the capacity to transform in the face of change. The capacity to persist might be the one that you're most familiar with, uh, particularly in the more individual sense of resilience in the terms of uh, being able to recover from some negative experience. One way to visualise resilience is through this so-called ball and cup diagram. Imagine the system, uh, whatever that is, uh, be it an individual, a community, an ecosystem or whatever, as rolling around in some landscape. The idea is that initially it's in one regime, so push it a little bit and it'll return to roughly the same area. But there's some critical threshold that is passed, or that can be passed, after which the system then transitions into another state. In in resilience thinking, this tradition, this transition is sometimes called a regime shift. And in uh, other areas of study, this point in the middle can be called a tipping point. So these concepts are pretty fundamental to the study of resilience. You can define a regime shift as a shift that is sudden, but also large and also difficult to reverse. One example of this could be a transition between forest and grasslands that's driven by fire. An important 
feature to realize is that each of these regimes are maintained by their own feedbacks. I'll introduce that term in a moment. That maintains each of these regimes. You can read up on a lot more examples of regime shifts at the regime shifts database. Here's a more social example, a more human example of a regime shift or tipping point. There's been a uh, rapid transition in a lot of countries over the last decade or two from a situation where smoking was widely socially accepted, including indoors at bars and restaurants and so on, to a situation uh, now where smoking is not allowed indoors, uh, not only through rules but through the social norms that uh, society has in general and entire university campuses have sometimes uh, forbidden smoking. This rapid transition between smoking being widespread and smoking not being allowed is another example of a regime shift, which is also uh, characterised by specific feedback loops. So what is a feedback loop? Well, it's a statement about causality. Uh, one way to represent feedback loops is through this, this kind of diagram. We start with understanding a, a causal link, which is when a change in something, A, causes a change in something else, B. And then we have a feedback when a chain of causations causes a loop. So something affects something else, which maybe affects something else, and then affect, affects the first thing. The familiar use of the term feedback is when we put a microphone too close to a speaker, the microphone picks up a noise, goes into the speaker, and we end up with this feedback loop. Even though initial sound might have been very small, we end up with this deafening noise after the feedback loop has operated. There are a couple of different types of feedback loops which come from a couple of different types of interactions. We can label a causal link as positive if a change in the first thing causes an increase in, and sorry, if an increase in the first thing causes an increase in the second thing. So for example, more baby rabbits usually leads to there being more adult rabbits a short time later, all else being equal. And then we label a link with a minus sign if an increase in the first thing causes a decrease in the second thing. So for example, there being more foxes usually means that there will soon be fewer rabbits, all else being equal. And then when we connect these links together into feedbacks, we find that there's two general different types of feedback loops. If we have an even number of minus signs around the loop, then we have what's called a positive or a reinforcing or a destabilizing feedback, which tends to send a certain phenomenon out of control. So for example, there's a positive feedback loop between the number of baby rabbits and the number of adult rabbits, as, uh, as many countries such as Australia have seen with explosions of rabbit pop populations. If we have an odd number of minus signs around the feedback loop, then we have what's called a negative or a balancing or a stabilizing feedback, which tends to keep phenomena under control. So there's a negative feedback loop between the number of adult rabbits and the number of foxes or some other rabbit predator, which can tends to keep the populations of rabbits uh, in check. So the way that feedback loops are related to tipping points are that regimes are generally stabilised by negative feedback loops. A tipping point, on the other hand, requires a positive feedback loop in order to destabilise that particular threshold. So for example, I mentioned before the positive feedback loop that can happen between grassland and the instance of fires. An important tipping point uh, in the Earth system is the potential feedback loop between rising temperatures, loss of Arctic ice and more heat absorbed by the darker sea that is revealed by the melted ice. In a more Social example, a more human example of a uh, tipping point, we have the possible uptake of electric vehicles. Electric cars will hopefully lead to there being more recharging stations, which means 
more uptake of electric cars. But without this feedback loop uh, being triggered, we might be stuck in a situation where there are few electric cars and few recharging stations. So sometimes these tipping points need, these feedbacks need a little bit of a push to get going. And one good example of a situation which might need a push is the example of a poverty trap, which I have studied recently in this paper. Uh, and we actually, in this paper, uncovered a different type, two different types of feedback loops involving poverty. Probably the most well-known example of a poverty trap involving the environment is where poor people are forced to degrade their environment because they have no other choice. They have to cut down the forest to uh, get fuel for their stoves because they don't have any other way of purchasing fuel. And that leads to a certain type of poverty environment trap. But in some other cases, poor people uh, are the ones who maintain or maybe even constructed their environment in the first place. And that leads to a very different type of feedback loop between poverty and environment. It's only when these areas start on a more uh, intensive agricultural trajectory that environmental degradation starts to increase. So these two different feedback loops lead to very different results for how we should intervene uh, to help these communities out of poverty. So understanding the feedback loops has a massive impact on what we should do uh, in terms of development and poverty alleviation. But so far I've been talking about resilience in terms of the capacity to persist, in terms of the capacity to stay as a forest or stay as a savanna, to be able to stay doing the same thing that you have before. But is that capacity being able to persist always good? I would say not. If you're a coastal community that is experiencing floods, being able to recover from those floods is a good thing. But as sea level rises, there has to come a point where you recognise that there's only so much that you can do in terms of drainage systems, in terms of sea walls. At some point, this coastal community will have to move. So adaptation refers to a process of change that enables a system to maintain its identity so that it's better able to cope with trends and shocks or to reduce vulnerability to disturbance. So in this coastal community example, this could be uh, building uh, seawalls that will help the community cope for a little while longer. Another example might be in the face of a declining population of a certain fish species switching to a different species of fish or installing a water tank to compensate for reduced rainfall or raising taxes on certain polluting activities. These kinds of changes can help resilience, uh, but they're more of the more incremental variety. Sometimes it's necessary to undergo a more substantial change if resilience is to, main, is to be maintained. So this kind of more substantial change we refer to as a transformation, which can be defined as a shift in a current system so to a substantively new and different one. Effective transformations, in contrast to adaptations, are often led by actors endogenous to the system. They're often intentional. They involve priorities different to the status quo and ideally they also lead to change across multiple levels of society. So some examples of a transformation might be a transformation in the food system where we transition to uh, locally and community supported agricultural programs, where we transition from a consumer economy to a sharing economy, or where we transform from um, petrol driven vehicles to electric vehicles. So to summarise, I've been talking to you about a particular version of resilience called social ecological resilience that I think is particularly useful for uh, understanding both the human and the ecological challenges of modern society. One useful way to think about social ecological resilience is as the capacity to persist when necessary, adapt when necessary or transform when necessary. 
This is a nice figure that shows that the capacity to persist is probably most useful in the very short term, adaptation is more useful in the medium term, and transformation is useful to deal with the more longer term threats. But this is just one way of understanding resilience that focuses on a particular aspect of the concept and there's plenty more to learn and understand about resilience as well. So my name was Steve Wade, thank you for listening.